Okay, it's now being 2 p.m., we'll move to uh, questions, and I call Senator Askew. I think. Yeah. Yeah. My question is to the minister representing the treasurer, Senator Gallagher. How much extra will an average mortgage holder be paying in monthly repayments as a result of the recent interest rate increases? Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. And, uh, we went to this uh, yesterday, I think, in question time, but I'm happy uh, to repeat it. Essentially, depending on the loan, uh, the size of the loan, uh, people will be paying a couple of hundred extra dollars um, a month in payments. Well, I can go exactly to it if you want to break it down. Um, and of course, these increases that they'll be paying are on top of the increases that have occurred over the recent months when the uh, RBA started increasing uh, interest rates on the 1st of May. Um, if you'd like it by state or by size of mortgage, I can give it to you. Um, but essentially, the cumulative increase in monthly repayments uh, for uh, average mortgage holder in New South Wales um, is, uh, I think, about $330 extra uh, per month. Um, but we can, there is significant impact on households, no doubt. Um, and we know this stings households, absolutely. But we are living in a high inflationary environment and the RBA is increasing interest rates. They are increasing interest rates to deal with higher inflationary costs across the economy. And these, the factors that led to this have occurred prior to the last election. Prior to the last election, the factors that are leading to this, we inherited an economy with an inflation issue and rising interest rates. Right. And these are hitting mortgage holders, without a doubt. And that's why our economic plan is more important than ever to invest in the productive side of the economy to put downward pressure on cost of living impacts for Thank households. You, Minister. Uh, Senator Askew, first supplementary. Minister, on top of the cost of interest rate increases, how much extra will it cost a family to fill a 60-litre tank of petrol once the government ends the reduction in fuel excise? Minister. So, order, 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 Senator Wong, Senator Searle, Senator Searle and Senator Wong. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And uh, talk about leading with your chin again. This is a policy that the former government put in place to expire. Um, the former treasurer saying it was targeted and temporary and made it very clear uh, because of the significant cost to a budget that is already heaving, heaving uh, minister, with a trillion dollars in liberal debt. Senator Askew. On relevance, it was actually a question about a dollar figure. It wasn't asking about consideration of previous policy. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Askew. The um, minister is being relevant to the question, but I'll continue to listen and uh, ensure that relevance continues. Minister. Thank you. Uh, and the former government at the time when they designed the policy to be a six-month exemption noted the significant cost to the budget, $3 billion over a six-month period, uh, which um, I've heard Senator Hume talking about the need to be fiscally responsible, while on the other side, and depending on who you're talking to in the coalition, it's all about uh, you know, spending more and adding more to the budget problems that we have inherited. Um, the petrol excise uh, changes were for six months. The budget cannot afford, cannot afford to continue uh, these concessions at a time when Thank we are Minister, dealing with the increasing cost. Senator of Askew, second supplementary. Uh, Senator Stirl. Senator Stirl. Senator Askew. Thank you. The Albanese government was elected on grand promises to fix the cost of living. What precisely is the government's plan to help senior Australians, young Australians and Australian families, including the majority who do not have children in childcare, with the cost of living? What's the plan? Thank you, Senator Askew. Our minister. 
thank you, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's economic plan. Yeah. Our plan is our plan is a comprehensive plan, a comprehensive plan that does include cheaper childcare for 1.2 million families. In your seat. Order, order. Uh, Minister Wong, Minister Wong. I'm waiting for quiet from both sides of the chamber. Minister, please resume. Thank you, uh, President. Labor's economic plan is about making sensible investments into the productive capacity of the economy, including cheaper childcare for 1.2 million, fa um, million families. It is important. Talk to anyone with children. That is a huge impact on your household budget. So that is what we are doing. Minister, cheaper medicines. Uh, Senator Watt, Senator Watt, that's disorderly to make uh, comments across the chamber. Order on my left, Senator Henderson. Minister, thank you for for those families without children, but this helps with for families with children as well. Uh, cheaper medicines for uh, skills and training, helping those with children and those without children, free TAFE and more uni places, investing in cleaner and cheaper energy, again, helping all households across Australia. This is the core parts of Labor's economic plan and we'll be Senator implementing Hughes. it as quickly Thank as we you, can. Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Uh, good. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can the minister outline steps the government is taking to assure Australia's security? Minister. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank the minister. For, I thank the senator for his question uh, and for his interest in um, international relations and foreign affairs and security. Uh, and today, the prime minister uh, and the defence minister announced details of the defence strategic review. Uh, in 2020, the Defence Strategic Update identified that changes in Australia's strategic environment were accelerating far more rapidly than was predicted in the 2012 Force Posture Review. So, To meet these challenges, the Defence Strategic Review, which was announced today, will examine force structure, force posture and preparedness. Uh, it will also inv examine investment prioritisation. Uh, and the objective, which I would hope is shared across the chamber, is to ensure that the Defence Force, Australian Defence Force, has the right capabilities to meet the growing strategic needs Australia faces. The government has appointed two eminent leads to conduct the review, the former Minister for Defence and for Foreign Affairs, Professor the Honourable Stephen Smith, and the former CDF, uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Angus Houston, retired. This work will help ensure that the ADF is well positioned to meet the security challenges we face over the next decade and beyond. Uh, you see, the Albanese government understands well that Australia's security in a more complex and contested world means we have to use all elements of state power and we have to ensure all elements of state power are fit for purpose, that is strategic, economic, social and diplomatic. And the purpose, of course, is always the advancement of Australian interest and Australian values. Unfortunately, we do know uh, there was a great deal of damage done to Australia's international relationships by the previous government. But we have made a strong start. Where we have made a strong start. Order. We have Order. made a. We have made Order. a strong start since the change Minister, of government. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Good. Uh, Thank you, Minister, for a comprehensive answer. Can the Minister outline the government's engagement with regional partners, including ASEAN? Minister. Thank you. Uh, and I again thank the Senator for a very important question. And of course, Southeast Asia uh, and the uh, focus on Southeast Asia is just so important for Australia's security. Uh, and something that we on this side of the chamber have always understood, we have always understood, and which is why if you look at the history of government in this country, it is Labor governments which have brought such a strong focus to Southeast Asia. We recognise on this side of the chamber that our future is tied to the future of the region we share. So deepening our partnership with ASEAN is one of my top, top priorities as Foreign Minister. Mm -hmm. Australia's interests lie in shaping a strategic equilibrium in the region. 
where countries are not forced to choose but can make their own sovereign choices, and ASEAN is central to that. Uh, I am today departing uh, for Phnom Penh for um, ASEAN meetings. Uh, it, a junket. Well, I'll take that interjection. It shows the disrespect for ASEAN and the importance of security in our region from the other side. And I suggest you should speak to Senator Birmingham about yeah. that interjection. Uh, order. Uh, your time has expired, Minister. Um, Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Uh, how is the government working to shape a region that are peaceful and, is peaceful and predictable and where disputes are not simply guided by power and size? Minister. Thank you. Um, uh, to the senator for the supplementary, and he, he phrases the question in a way that is really important. Um, others have described it differently. Uh, we want a region that is non-hegemonic. We want a region where sovereignty is protected. Uh, but it is in Australia's interest, and this I do think is a bipartisan objective, even if how we get there we may differ on. We want a region where disputes are not simply guided by power and size. Uh, and central to that is working with the countries of our region, including ASEAN, uh, as well as the Pacific, uh, ensuring we have relationships that are deep and trusting, uh, and relationships where we uh, are able to be a partner of choice. Uh, partnerships matter because it's how we build the kind of region we want. It's how we build the kind of region uh, that serves, uh, that, that is in accordance with the interests of the Australian people and the interests of the nation, a region at peace, not in conflict, which is why we will continue to work with partners to promote peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Will the level of government spending in the Albanese government's first budget be higher or lower than was projected in the pre-election fiscal outlook. Minister, you'll have to wait and see. From the fiscal order, order. <laughs> Thank you. Order. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to wait for quiet on both sides. Order, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Um, the short answer to the question from Senator Smith, and I thank him for the question, is you'll have to wait and see. That's what yeah. happens when you're in opposition. Um, the budget will be published. The budget will be published, and you will be able to see. Well, well, um, I think anybody who followed Labor's very comprehensive um, fiscal uh, plan. And Hughes. No Labor's plan for a better budget, better future, better budget, better future. Minister, please resume your seat. Order, order. I'm aware that you're standing, Senator Smith. I'm waiting for quiet, Senator Smith. Point of order, Madam President. Standing order two one one. I'm just wondering whether Senator Gallagher could let us know how many pages are in the plan. I think that, How many might, page? that might be a supplementary <laughs> question. You may wish to pursue, uh, Senator Smith. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Senator Smith, that was tried in the campaign. It didn't go very far, I must say. It's, uh, it's more about the content, I think, um, than the number of pages. And this is a very successful plan that we outlined. It's very successful, Order. as evidenced Order. by this. Um, that's how successful this plan was. Uh, the budget will be released um, in the normal way uh, with the papers that accompany it. And I would say, in, in respect to, um, because I do respect Senator Smith, um, we are going through a process which we have been quite clear about of looking at previous um, budget measures from the March budget about which ones of those should go ahead, which ones um, might not be, need to go ahead. We're looking at savings. We're uh, where they can be sensibly found. We're implementing our savings on um, consultants and contractors, the audit of waste and rorts, indeed, uh, that we are looking at. Uh, and we're going through it program by program with a big red pen. Um, and we are looking, well, we are going to be fiscally responsible. We are not going to be the vandals that you were, where you would just get huge lump billions of dollars and go, you know what? Order. Barnaby Joyce wants some money somewhere, so Order. here we go. We'll chuck it over there. We'll chuck it over here. We're building better regions funds. Oh, sorry, Barnaby. Here's some more uh, money. Minister, We're not going to do that. Minister, We're not going to do it. It's not right. Your, resume your seat. Senator Henderson. 
Madam President, on a point of order, could I ask oh, just these— Just a moment. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Um, Madam President, on a point of order, could I ask the minister to refer to members by their proper name? Thank you. I will draw that to the minister's attention. Thank you, uh, Senator Henderson. I remind all uh, senators that um, people in this chamber and the other chamber need to be referred to by their correct titles. Minister. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. And uh, the point I was making is that we will be fiscally responsible. We want to build a budget for a better Thank future you, for minister. Australia. Your time has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam President. Will decisions of the Albanese government in its first budget add, in net terms, to government spending and debt, or reduce government spending and debt? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you. Well, as we've been clear, we've been clear. Order. Order. Senator, uh, Minister, resume your seat. Minister Wong. Senator Wong and Senator Henderson, exchanges across the chamber are disorderly. And my beg your pardon if it wasn't you, but it is very hard with the level of noise um, to work out who is making the noise. But comments across the chamber are disorderly, Minister. Thank you. Well, the, the answer to that question uh, is contingent on a number of decisions that are yet to be made. Um, but we, through through the budget. Well, what do you expect? Well, well I'm being honest with you. Minister, I'm being honest. Resume your seat, please. Senator Billy. Huge trouble hearing Senator Gallagher's wonderful response. So could you? Uh, thank you, Senator Billy. I'm trying my very best, which is why I keep sitting the minister down. Sadly. Order. Order. I'm sure that Minister Senator Wong and Birmingham. Right, Minister, please continue. Thank you. Um, so the, that's the very clear answer. Is the decisions that will be uh, made to answer his question are going to be made during the budget process, which we are underway now. But I can tell you that it will end the rorts. Um, it, it will end the waste. It will uh, make the savings we promised in reducing advertising. Remember all those advertising campaigns yeah. that were. Yeah. They were always ready to go before the actual programs were ready. Uh, they were out the door pretty quickly. We will. Uh, the budget will be handed Order. down the 25th of October. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. If government spending will be higher, and I noticed that Senator Gallagher didn't rule that out, if spending will be higher under the Albanese government, won't this see fiscal policy work against monetary policy and mean that the Albanese government spending will place Order. further upward pressure on interest rates? Oh, oh. I'm not going to call the minister until there is quiet. Uh, Senator McGrath and Senator Wong. I'm waiting, um, Minister. President, no, I, I, I think they've set Senator Smith up here because, on the one hand, we're being uh, had arguments to uh, spend three billion dollars more over six months for petrol excise, and on the other hand, I'm being asked, I'm being asked about. If we're spending Minister, more, whether it's going to be Minister, pressure on interest rates. Please resume your seat. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Madam President. Standing Order 211, I was very, very specific. I wanted to know whether or not there was a risk that the government spending would mean that its monetary policy would end up working against fiscal policy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Smith. I believe that the minister is being directly relevant. but. Uh, Let's uh, continue with her response. Thank you, Thank Minister. you, President. Well, the opposition's policies would be working against monetary policy, I have to say, or as I understand them, and I'm not sure which, who's got the, um, the power at the moment. But this question comes from the highest spending, highest borrowing Shame. government in Shame. Australia's history. That, that's what you guys were. That's what you guys were. My job is to try and fix that. My job is to try and fix that, Order. rebalance the budget, end the rorts tidy up the waste, get rid of the waste, find the savings where I can find them and invest in the productive side of the economy, which is absolutely in line, hand in hand with monetary Order. policy. If you are investing in the productive side of the economy and putting downward pressure on inflation and the interest rates that we inherited from you lot. Thank you, Minister. Uh, before I call you, uh, Senator Hanson-Young, order. 
I would like to acknowledge that um, we have uh, Minister Ubio from the Northern Territory, um, who is the Minister for Indigenous Affairs uh, in the gallery. So welcome. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, my question is to Minister Wong, representing both the Prime Minister and the Minister for Water. 450 gigalitres of water was promised under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan for South Australia and the environment, but the Liberal National Party have monumentally stuffed up the delivery of this water at the expense of taxpayers and the health of the river. In the election campaign, the Albanese government promised and committed to delivering the 450 on time and in full. Is this still your government's commitment? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator Hanson Young for the question. And uh, I think one thing that we can all say is that every South Australian in this chamber should, and certainly those on this side of the chamber, and I'll include yourself in that. Order. Every. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Wong, address your comments to the chair, please. Oh. Well, I am a senator for South Australia, and so is Senator Hanson Young. I apologise for the constitution, Senator, senator Wong. But I mean, the reality is this: that we, we had a water. We, the Minister for Environment and Water tabled the second review of Water for the Environment Special Account Report, and just like the member for Hume, who hid a price rise uh, for electricity, this was also hidden to the South to the, to the Australian people yeah, before the election. And you know why? You know why? Because what it showed is the decade of sabotage that those opposite have engaged in when it comes to the Murray Darling Basin Plan. They promised 450 gigs. You know how many, how many they delivered? Two. Two out of 450. Two out of 450. And we know why? Because they never wanted to deliver it. They never wanted to deliver it. Well, never wanted to deliver it, and we know that because the National Party are still saying that and Senator came into Hume. the chamber whilst in government, whilst in government, and tried to blow up the Murray Darling plan. Now I invite Senator Birmingham, as the most senior South Australian, to pull um, rein in. I, I will get to it. We'll, to rein in uh, those on that side who continue to want to sabotage this important reform. Uh, we have made clear Labor is committed to delivering Senator the basin Hume. plan in full. It's what we signed up for. Uh, and the minister has made it clear uh, that remains uh, the approach. But I would say this. It has become a great deal harder now that it has been disclosed that you delivered two out of 450. Why did you think that was OK? Why did they think it was OK to hide that before the election? No, I'm not surprised um, you Senator take Wong, a point of order. Senator please resume your seat. A Senator Davey, wait, point, point of Senator order. Davey, wait until you're called. Senator Davey. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Point of order, uh, Senator Wong is actually misleading the chamber with her claims that only um, two that gigalitres was recovered. Point. Thank you, Senator Davey. Please resume your seat. Minister. Thank you. State of the Environment report makes it clear uh, that two out of 450 was delivered. Senator Hanson Young, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I note that the uh, minister did not answer the question about on time. Uh, given the legal requirement to deliver the 450, given the promise to South Australians, what is the government's plan to make sure that 450 gigalitres is delivered, is used to save the river and not stolen by those upstream? Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, President. And I again hear the interjections from the National Party. We wonder why a coalition never delivered on this. And I do remember when I was water minister and I bought a lot of water. How angry, how angry they were that we actually bought water for the environment from willing sellers. From willing sellers. Order. Oh my goodness, isn't it dreadful to use a market to deliver an environmental and a social outcome? Oh, that is, um, I mean Senator it's a dreadful Wong. thing, isn't it, to actually actually Order. <laughs> Order. I am unable to hear Senator Wong's response. Please remain quiet and show courtesy. Thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, 
The Minister for the Environment and Water confirmed yesterday she has written to and is speaking to Basin Water Ministers because obviously uh, we have to work with the states uh, in order to deliver this. Uh, Minister Plibersek has also tasked her department to consult widely on creative and collaborative approaches on how we can deliver the plan in full. And I say this, nothing is off the table, including voluntary buybacks. Yeah. Including voluntary buybacks. Uh, because it is clear, it's, it is clear that the approach that was taken on the other thank side. Thank you, Minister. Did not Your time work. has expired. Senator Hanson Young, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I'm very uh, pleased to hear that voluntary buybacks are uh, on the table because it is clear from the government's own report that this is the only way 450 gigalitres will be returned to the river. Will the government commit to working with South Australia? the South Australian government and the South Australian people to make sure it is delivered. Thank you, Senator Hanson-Young. Um, Senator McKenzie. Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you to Senator Hanson Young for her question. And, and I just might pick up two comment, uh, part, parts of her question. She, she, she talks about the need to change the policy settings effectively, and she's right. Uh, the, the report says Order. the report that was commissioned by your government, which you hid prior to the election, says that these targets cannot be met under the settings that you put in place. Shame. You can't meet it on the sense you put in place. Now, it's the easiest thing, isn't it, for a politician to go, go to upstream and downstream and say different things to different communities and pretend they're going to do something. At least tell people the truth. I, I accept you don't agree. I accept you don't agree with our position. So I am uh, Senator Henderson. Rise and, and um, draw to your attention the need for Senator Wong to direct her comments through the chair. Uh, Thanks thank very you, much, Madam um, President. Senator Henderson, I would also draw to the chamber's attention the general disorderly conduct in here. So I would ask all senators to um, be courteous to one another, and I would uh, just remind senators that comments are directed to the chair. Senator Wong, please continue. Fair enough. I, 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 do get, I do like to respond to the misinformation that's provided by the National Party, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't take the bait because they've been doing it for years. They've been pretending for years. The report indicates there are not enough off-farm projects to reach the 450 gigs, even with unlimited time and money. Uh, so clearly, you, clearly a different Your approach has, has to be expired. taken. Senator White. Uh, President, this is not my first speech, but it is my first question. <laughs> my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister outline the findings of the Productivity Commission's inquiry, five-year productivity inquiry, the key to prosperity interim report that has been released today? Good question. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I congratulate uh, Senator White on her first question, and thank you. Um, and it's an honour to to um, have be the answer of your first question. Uh, the report out today paints a dismal picture of recent productivity growth. Over the last decade, growth has been the slowest in more than a century. Yeah, no surprises there. Gross national income was $4,600 lower per person than what it could have been if productivity growth was in line with the long-term average. This is important because 80 per cent of income growth in the past three decades has come from productivity gains. So we should not be surprised, sadly, that the past decade that we've seen with real wages is largely due to the poor decade we've also had on productivity. The report said very clearly almost all sustained increases in real wages are underpinned by improvements in labour productivity growth. And being more productive means Australians can consume higher quality and completely new and access new goods and services. Getting productivity moving again is a huge challenge that has been neglected under those opposite, and it's a challenge that we take seriously, which is why Labor's economic plan is so important. Investments into the productive side of the economy, the productivity agenda is at the heart of our economic plan. Childcare reform, skills and advanced manufacturing, and of course the opportunities that are going to come in the energy sector. The report is yet another Senator scathing Henderson. assessment of the former government's failure to drive reform or grab the opportunities for jobs and growth that they should have, and Australians have paid an enormous price for that. 
Thank you, Minister. Senator White, sec first supplementary. Now, can the minister advise the Senate on what has caused the slow pace of productivity growth as outlined in the report? Minister. It's very, very quiet over there on the opposition benches. The Productivity Commit Committee's report states that most OECD countries— Order. Order on both sides, Minister. Thank you. You should, you should ignore me. <laughs> I don't know about that. Minister. The Productivity, Committee's, uh, Productivity Commission's report states that most OECD countries have experienced a productivity slowdown. However, we know that the productivity challenges we face have been made worse by a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities of those opposite. And there is no starker example of this than the coalition's wasted decade on energy. 22 different energy policies over their term in government it's seen the opportunities for investment, innovation and jobs go begging. We pay the price for that. This really was uh, the Morrison government, a government that spent more, borrowed more and delivered less, including in the productivity agenda, which has been outlined you, uh, in the public Your time release has today. Expired. Senator White, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister further advise the Senate what the government's plans are to boost productivity in the Australian economy? Minister. Thank you. I, thank you, uh, President. Yes, I can. Thank you, Senator White, for the question. The Albanese government's economic plan is a plan to boost productivity, Senator take Hughes. the speed limit off the economy and create the right kind of growth. It will be a key focus of our upcoming Jobs and Skills Summit. Our plans include investing in cleaner and cheaper energy, better training our workforce through fee-free TAFE and more university places, investing in cheaper childcare boosting GDP Order. through higher workforce participation, upgrading the NBN to begin capturing the digital e um, economic opportunities, creating a future made in Australia President, with procurement and co-investment plans through the National Reconstruction Fund to stimulate billions of dollars in private investment. And this is in line Senator and in Henderson. step with the direction of the PC's report released today. Uh, Senator Hanson. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. We are constantly hearing from businesses, farmers and industries that they can't get workers. In the meantime, almost 950,000 people are collecting unemployment benefits. Something has to give, and the answer is not higher immigration, which will only put a greater burden on our hospitals, doctors, schools, nursing homes roads and infrastructure, especially housing. How do you intend to address this crippling shortage of workers? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Thank you to um, Senator Hanson for the question. And, and she is right that labour shortages and skill shortages are, are identified by uh, uh, many in the private, se well, by the private sector, by business leaders as being uh, a, a handbrake uh, on, on the economy uh, and on you know, the profitability of many businesses. And you know, we know that from the data, and we also know that if you, if you go and talk to small and medium enterprises as well as to business leaders. Um, obviously, there is no quick fix to this. Um, the, the first point is, well, you know, obviously, what, what the government can do uh, is to implement its policies, which include uh, in establishing fee-free TAFE places in areas of school shortages, additional university places, to try and ensure we give Australians the skills that are needed for the jobs of today and tomorrow. So, you know, That is a very important part of our investment in people. Um, uh, the, the senator um, raises migration. You know, the view the, the Labor government takes is you have to address uh, it, labour shortages through a balanced approach, which includes efforts to train and upskill Australian workers, uh, but also recognises that there is a place for migration, whether that's um, permanent migration or other forms of migration. 
from, from Labor's perspective, uh, we, we don't want to see a situation where, as it was under the previous government, migration is used as a stopgap, uh, as a fill-in, as a way of dealing with a skill shortage, which uh, in great part arose because there was a failure to properly fund and support Australians to get the, the skills that are required. Equally, you know, with the Labor Party, we don't want workers being exploited. And, and you might recall in the previous parliament there was quite a lot of focus on the exploitation of migrant workers, particularly uh, in, in the agricultural and other areas. So my answer is uh, a balanced approach. Obviously, our priority Thank you, is Minister, to, your time to invest has in the expired. skills. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Thank you. Well, actually, um, Minister, I do have a quick fix for you. With thousands of people having been on long-term unemployment benefits for decades, even passing it on as a family tradition, will you move legislation to ensure that no one can receive unlimited dole payments for more than two years out of five if they are capable of doing a day's work? Minister. Uh, uh, thank you to Senator Hanson. Uh, and uh, obviously, I'm sure the minister representing the Minister for Social Security uh, or uh, might be able to or employ, uh, employment and workplace relations might be able to provide a, a more detailed answer on, on mutual obligation. Uh, both parties of government at different times and have had different approaches but have obligations frameworks in relation to receipt of social security benefits. Uh, so uh, you know that is uh, obviously uh, an approach that is taken, bearing in mind the need to be you know, sensible and balanced and responsible through that. I would make the point that actually at the moment we, we do have a participation rate that is uh, quite high. Um, so the participation rate is at 66.8 per cent and the employment to population ratio of six, is at 64.4 per cent. So actually there are, quite, there are a great many Australians who are participating in the economy and are participating in the labour market. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Minister, this is why I've asked the question of the Prime Minister. In the lead up to the election, he said he had answers for these problems with Australian people. So this is why I want a direct answer from the Prime Minister with regards to this through you. We have a vast untapped workforce of older Australians on the age pension with um, more than willing to work to supplement their income in these difficult times. Will you legislate for age pensioners to be able to take on more work without penalty to their benefits and give independent retirees who are no burden on the taxpayer the same opportunities to fill our critical work shortages? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Hanson. Well, I, I will uh, ensure I'll answer what I can, uh, and I'll ensure that if there is more information that can be provided to you, that it is provided to you. Uh, you, you, you uh, I, I was a member of a, a government previously, which uh, put in place the work bonus in 2009 for precisely the, the reasons that you outlined. That there were people uh, who wanted. Uh, to do more work without it affecting uh, their pension. Uh, and there is obviously a disincentive, just as there is in relation to childcare, but it's a different, slightly different issue, a disincentive for pensioners to work if it was going to affect their income. So when last in government we did introduce measures which enable people to, to earn more before their pension was, was uh, affected. Um, I think that um, obviously uh, the, the, the jobs and uh, the, the summit that is it, it is uh, the jobs and skills summit, uh, which the uh, which the well, so actually having people talk to each other sometimes yeah, isn't a bad idea. <coughs> I know that seems I know that um, seems Minister, unusual. Your time but has expired. Thank you, Senator Henderson. I thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer to the Treasurer's statement that you will be going through the budget line by line and making sure that spending is about building value and not buying votes. In light of this, will the government be honouring its pre-election promise to spend $20,000 building a frog bog at Malmesbury Primary School announced in the Labor electorate of Bendigo just 15 days before the election? Minister. Um, uh, thank you, President. I'm trying to drop the madam, and I thank Senator Henderson for the question. And I, Order. I thank her, Minister. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson has asked a specific question, which the minister has stood to answer, and there's disorderly calling out on both sides of the chamber, Senator Stirl. Order. 
Minister. Thank you, um, President. And I thank Senator Henderson for the question and for reminding the Chamber of the uh, fiscally responsible way that we are going about managing uh, a broken budget heaving with a trillion dollars in Liberal debt after we inherited a budget from a government that had spent more, borrowed more and delivered less than any uh, other government. Minister, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for your own side, Senator Henderson, to be quiet so I can uh, ask you your—I'm assuming it's a point of order? Yes, it is. I'm waiting ahead. for you to give me the call. Yeah, I'm waiting. Yes, Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, on a point of order, direct relevance, it was a very specific question relating to a pre-election promise to spend $20,000 building a frog bog. Yes or no? Will that be delivered? Thank you, and including, Senator Henderson. is it fiscally oh, responsible? Okay. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Order! 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 Senator McGrath. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson has raised a point of order. She is entitled to a response. It is, you did ask a general question. You talked about line by line, and then you asked specifically in relation to a budget measure at a particular school. So I, the minister is being relevant. Minister. Thank you, um, President. And I, I will get uh, to the, uh, the, the substance of the question, but as you said, um, the senator did go to the fact that we are auditing the budget and going through it line by line, and it is really important work. Um, it's essential work if we are going to reprioritise within existing funding uh, to take uh, to shift the budget from political buy-offs that um, plagued the previous government. Well, order. The member for New England seemed to get a lot of attention. The price of net zero wasn't zero, was it, Senator Birmingham? No. And we saw that in the we saw that in the budget with billions of dollars, billions order. of dollars. The government made a range of election commitments. They're all contained in this plan, which I'm sure you all have, because it's it's very very successful plan that order. we took to the last election. The election commitments, and as Minister, outlined in this plan, oh, Senator Henderson. Madam President, I regret to have to raise a point of order on direct relevance again. Uh, it was a question specifically about whether the frog bog, uh, oh, no. whether it's fiscally responsible, Senator is very Henderson, questionable. Will, will this? Your seat. Will I've asked. I've uh, the, there is no point of order. It was a order. I'm um, Senator Stirl. Order. The minister is being relevant. Minister. Uh, thank you. This document, which outlined all of our election commitments and their fiscal impact, are uh, contained in this document, and it is the government's intention, as the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, to do what we promised we would do before the election if we were successful. So the answer to that is Order, where Senator we have made McGrath. election commitments, we will be delivering on them. Thank you, Minister. Senator Henderson, first supplementary. Uh, I again refer to the Treasurer's statement that you will be making sure that spending is about building value, not buying votes. And I'm quite confused by the last response because it sounds like the Minister is contradicting herself. One minute it's assessing and the next minute it's... I'm sorry, um, Minister, I haven't finished my question. <laughs> There's no point of order. I haven't finished my question. Resume your seat. <laughs> Senator Henderson, please sit down. Order. Order. Minister. Senator Watt. Order. Oh, no, it, it is hard. Senator Wong. It, that is not a question. The standing orders don't contemplate a speech where there's, instead of questions. Senator Birmingham. The point of order, President. Uh, earlier this week, President, you, uh, you provided some advice to the chamber in relation to supplementary questions, having been asked to do so by Senator Wong and those opposite. Uh, in that advice, you did uh, encourage those making supplementary questions uh, to ensure their supplementary question drew a link to the answer that was provided uh, previously, which is precisely what Senator Henderson was just doing. Um, 
Senator Wong, I'm going to rule on uh, the point of order unless there's uh, a different point that you wish to make. Point of order. I'm not sure that the st confused state of the senator's mind, as she described it, her state of confusion, is something that is necessarily an important part of a question. Thank you. I draw um, Senator Henderson. Please resume your seat. Unless it's an entirely different point of order, which I will come to after I've ruled on your first point of order. So I haven't yet ruled on your first point of order, so please resume your seat. On the point of I order. said I would come to that after I've ruled on this point of order. I draw um, Senator's attention to um, rules for questions 106, which simply say, and this has been reinforced by a number of presidents, that questions should not be prefaced by a statement. Senator Henderson, you have a second point of order. In relation to Senator Wong's derogatory statement about my state of mind— uh, Senator Henderson, um, there was no point yes, of order sorry, there. Sorry, can I make the point of order, no, Madam you, President? No, I've ruled on it. There is no point no, of order. Point Please of order resume your seat. Please resume your this. May I also remind senators? Please re resume your seat. That points of order are not opportunities for group discussions. That was Senator Parry. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson, I'm not entertaining a point of order. Senator Henderson, may I draw your attention to the fact that I am the president of the Senate? not you, and that when I ask you to resume your seat, that is what I expect to happen, and I don't expect you to continue to try and debate an issue. Minister. Uh, Mr Pre uh, Madam President, um, I, I thought I was referencing Senator Henson Henderson describing herself as being confused by the minister's answer, but if, I, if, if it was offensive to her, I'm very happy to withdraw. Minute. No. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson, I've just drawn to your attention that it's not a debating point. The question is live. Please resume your seat. Minister. She was only halfway through it. Yeah. So, order. Order. My apologies, Senator Henderson. There's been so much disruption that I was confused. I thought the minister was answering. Could I just get some clarification? Could I start the question again yes, and start the clock at the top? Yep. Thank you. Um, I again refer to the Treasurer's statement that you will not that you'll be making sure that spending is about building value, not buying votes. In light of this, Will the government be honouring its pre-election promise to spend $11,000 painting a mural at the Kingsway markets announced in the now Labor electorate of Pearce just seven days before the election? Minister. Uh, President, and thank, thank you, Minister. Pre please resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Order. Senator Henderson has asked a question to which the minister rose and she's entitled to give her response in silence. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Well, as I said, the answer is the same as the previous answer in that uh, where we have made election commitments, we intend to deliver upon those election commitments. Uh, we are ensuring well, we are building value. We are building value, and many, all of those uh, community programs that order, we order, order. Minister, please continue. Oh, I believe the minister is still continuing. Uh, thank you. We made a range of commitments across a number of electorates uh, around small community uh, programs and sporting infrastructure programs. They were detailed and outlined ahead of the election and in our election costings. They are modest and they are Order. important to local communities. And it stands in stark contrast to the approach that those opposite took when you embezzled funds from uh, the car park, car park rorts. Remember that established, told everyone it was eligible, you were eligible for them, and then Thank when you, put it in their Your own— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. 
Senator Henderson, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. From frog bogs to murals, sand pits, splash parks, or even a wall of friendship, um, can the minister confirm the contrary? Senator Henderson, the contrary to please resume your seat. Did you have a point of order, Senator Wong? Order. 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 Senator Henderson, please continue. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Senator Madam Wong. President, I'm sorry. Sen Senator Wong order. is making order. A, on a point of order. On a point of order, Madam President, Senator Wong is making disparaging comments across the table about me continuously. Could I ask you to ask her to cease this behaviour? Um, Senator Henderson. There is so much noise in the chamber, it is impossible for me to hear. But if Senator Wong would like to ref please resume your seat. If Senator, if Senator Wong would like to consider the comments she made, which I did not hear, and withdraw them if necessary. Thank is, you. I'm a little Are you asking me to withdraw my comment that you've lost Karanga no, Mike twice? Is that what I'm asked to withdraw? I, I don't I've, understand. I, I'm always happy. I think people know in this place. I'm always happy to withdraw if it assists the chamber. Thank you. Senator Henderson, I'm you being don't asked have to withdraw. Call. What am I being asked to withdraw, Senator? What, that you lost Karangamite twice? Senator Wong. Is that that's what you want me? Senator Wong. Oh, Order. It's a fact. I'm not sure why I'm supposed Order. to withdraw, but if it assists, I withdraw. Senator Henderson, please continue. Um, from frog bogs to murals, sand pits wall, and the wall of friendship, can the minister confirm that, contrary to the Treasurer's lofty statement about not buying votes, the Albanese government went on, on, a, went on a massive pre-election vote-buying spree across Labor and Your marginal time has expired. electorates? Thank you. Order on my right. Order. Order. Minister. Senator Mario Smith. Order on my right. I'm Minister. <laughs> Part of the call. Order. <laughs> Minister, please. Uh, thank you. Well, the first point I'd make, um, President, is I will not be lectured about buying votes uh, from a, gov a former government that spent nine years and billions of dollars doing exactly that in every single budget. Where we made local commitments, important community investments in local infrastructure and sport that was supported by local communities at the election, very modest program. We made those commitments before the election. In case you didn't notice, we won the election and we will be delivering on those election commitments in full. In full. Thank you, Minister. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Women, also representing the Minister for Health, uh, Minister Gallagher. Polling released today by Fair Agenda confirms that there's strong public support for improving abortion access, with 72 per cent of Australians agreeing that governments should make abortions more readily accessible. Fair Agenda, Murray Stopes and Children by Choice have all proposed solutions, including expanding Medicare coverage, nurse-led abortion care and better access to long-acting reversible contraceptives. Will the Health Minister support including medical and surgical abortions as an MBS item number to ensure that no one is denied the procedure because they can't afford it? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator Waters. Uh, for her question on this very important uh, subject. Um, in terms of the work that is underway uh, at the moment, and this is work that the Assistant Minister for Health, um, Minister Kearney, will be doing uh, alongside the Minister for Health, is looking at essentially access to health services for women um, and putting together a plan around that. Um, to, and I've had some discussions with her already about this. We also had discussions at the first uh, meeting of women's and women's safety ministers a fortnight ago, uh, where there was some discussion about um, looking at uh, whether legislation that regulates access to termination of pregnancy services around states and territories uh, could be um, 
aligned, uh, better, harmonised, um, and that's work um, that we'll let, uh, leave to the states and territories as that's the, the appropriate place. But I did say uh, that access to um, health services is really important to the Albanese government, um, making sure that um, we are looking at areas particularly for uh, women living in rural and remote communities who have um, less access to termination of pregnancy services, in some cases no access. And uh, those issues will be discussed and examined through the work that um, the Assistant Minister for Health will be doing. So it's, I'm not in a position uh, to answer your correct question directly, but the answer I give you is that there is work underway, um, consultations that will happen uh, at the appropriate level, and then we'll go through a further process around that. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. The polling also showed that 69 per cent of Australians agree that the government should address barriers to access in rural and regional areas. As few as, as, few as 1 per cent of GPs in rural and regional areas are currently registered to prescribe medical abortions. What is the government doing to increase the number of GPs who are able to prescribe medical abortions? And do you support nurse-led models of care to increase access? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, President, and I think those really are questions that will come up uh, through the stakeholder consultations that Minister um, Carney will do, um, will undertake. So again, it's probably it, it is too early for me to answer that question directly. Um, but um, we are um, the work where it'll intersect with my work is around the national gender equality strategy, and women's health will be a focus of that as well. So um, there is essentially we are doing further work. Um, both on the uh, gender equality strategy and the work that Minister uh, Carney is dealing with in terms of access to health services, uh, and further consultations will be held. I know this is an issue that has been raised with me, and it's appropriate that we allow those discussions to happen. Thank you, Minister. Second supplementary, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Research uh, released today also shows an increase in women being subjected to reproductive coercion, including from partners or from counsellors that they seek pregnancy advice from. Will the government address reproductive coercion in the new national plan to end violence against women and their children and take action to ensure that all pregnancy counselling is unbiased? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Well, the issue of coercion um, is dealt with in uh, the national plan. So, um, you know, uh, I would have to go back and check. It's, we're currently in the process, or Minister Rishworth is leading that work and finalising uh, the details of that plan um, after our meeting with state and territory ministers. But the the broader issue of coercive control uh, is absolutely um, part of those discussions. Um, you know, and I think part of your question would fall into that area, but I'm happy to take further advice on that and come back to the chamber if I can provide an update. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Tourism, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister provide an update on the condition of the tourism sector and tourism jobs? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank I think. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Senator uh, Polly, um, an excellent senator from the great state of Tasmania, and uh, always asks um, very, very good questions. Um, look, I, Senator I, McKenzie. Uh, Senator McKenzie. You, you can talk about handouts. You can talk about Sen handouts, Senator, senator Farrell, McKenzie. Address your uh, comments to the chair and not my, across the chamber. My apologies, President. I will direct uh, the answer to uh, to you. Um, yeah, look, the uh, tourism sector has suffered uh, terribly over the last uh, two two and a half years, um, and I regret to say a lot of that um, uh, that suffering was uh, brought about and exacerbated by the actions of the former uh, former government. Um, just 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 one example. Just. Just, Order. just one example. <coughs> Sorry, just, just one example, President. Um, right, right, Order. right, right, right. When um, closing, uh, close, closings Senator and um, outbreaks were underway in a whole range of key tourist areas, what did this government do? Former government do? It, 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 
it took away the job keeper. Now the job keeper, the job keeper, the job. The Minister, job, resume your seat. Order. Minister. No, you should have spent. You should have. You should have spent better. You should have. You should have. Minister, please resume your seat. When there's silence, I will go to Senator Henderson, who's on her feet. Senator Henderson. I would just ask the minister to direct his comments through the chair. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I would also ask uh, senators, particularly on my left, to give the minister the respect to which he's entitled to and to listen quietly. Minister, please direct your questions through the chair. Minister of the Crown. Thank you, thank you, President. And I was directing my comments uh, to you following your earlier exhortation. Um, <coughs> Well, maybe you could have maybe maybe you could have saved some money on not spending 5.5 billion dollars on submarines right. on submarines right. that never ever got built. Right. But getting back getting back to the topic. Order, order. Oh, you've got one of your own senators on their feet. Senator, the wait for the call, Senator Henderson. Senator Henderson. Because are on their training wheels, but I would again remind them to not to direct their comments uh, through you. Uh, the minister was doing that. There is a lot of noise uh, on the left-hand side of the chamber. Minister Farrell. I've continued to direct all of my comments uh, to you, President. Just to be clear about that. <laughs> now, um, throughout this period, um, these tourism tourism operators held on held on to their businesses sometimes by the oh beg the your pardon it's time sorry <laughs> senator farrell uh, senator polly first supplementary thank you minister it's been nine long years before i've asked a question that a minister's been able to answer but how how has this order. how has this order that's a bit harsh helen Time Order. How has this workforce and skills shortage led to challenges for tourism businesses and high costs for consumers? Minister. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President. And I thank uh, Senator Polly for once again an excellent uh, question. Um, Order. I, look, I like all my colleagues. Uh, Unlike you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Farrell. Uh, Senator Farrell. No, they just don't like him. They just don't like him. Please continue. It's going to be a, it's going to be a fun question Order. time tomorrow. I can tell you that. Um, President, uh, businesses uh, were forced to let go of staff, and they've struggled to get them back. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, um, throughout this period, while people um, who really liked working in the tourism sector suddenly found that um, their employment was no longer secure. Every time there was a, uh, a lockdown, they lost their job. And so uh, when the labour shortages occurred in other parts of the economy, of course, what Thank was the— Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. What steps are the Albanese Labor government taking to address the mess left by the former government? Senate, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And uh, another excellent question from um, uh, Senator Minister, uh, Polly. Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator McKenzie. I am looking for uh, the answer, along with Senator Polly, to probably her last two questions. But point of order um, is, uh, I am, having listened very carefully to Senator Polly's supplementary, I, I don't know how it's related to her first question on Tasmanian tourism. I haven't. Uh, I believe it's relevant. I will just uh, double check with the clerk. Uh, thank you. I am advised that it is irrelevant as long as Senator Farrell restricts his comments to the tourism area, which he actually has been doing. Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, look, I know you don't like. I know you like don't like hearing these these answers, but but 
I've got I've got 49 seconds to do it. Order. We Order. are committed. The Labor Party is committed to working with the tourism sector uh, to address these skill shortages. The Albanese government will put real money on the table to support the industry, Senator including McGrath. for money, in, including money. Yes, promises that we took to the Senator last Birmingham. election to support this industry, which you failed to do for the previous. Minister Farrell. No, uh, Senator Henderson. Madam President, uh, you didn't fail to do anything. I would ask the minister to again uh, make his comments through the chair uh, thank you, and Senator to be Henderson. mindful of the thank error that he's Senator making Henderson. continually. Uh, the minister is making his comments through the chair. There is a fair amount of order, order, order. There is a fair amount of joking going back and forward across the chamber. Um, I believe generally the minister is making his comments through the chair, and I would invite him to continue his remarks. President, and uh, thank you for that protection. <laughs> um, now we're prioritising the backlog of uh, migrant working visas to increase labour supply. We're opening up, as uh, uh, the uh, um, minister Wong previously said, new fee-free uh, TAFE uh, places to skill up workers. And uh, that will include 45,000 places Farrell. across— Thank you, Your time has expired. Senator Wong. I I'm tempted, Madam— uh, I'm tempted, Order. President, to move an extension of time, but I do— <laughs> I, I, do I ask that further questions be placed Thank on you. notice and wish everyone well for the question time I won't be out tomorrow. <laughs> Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, yesterday, in question time, in response to a question from Senator Pocock, <laughs> I undertook to provide some further information in response to his question on housing and homelessness. Um, I understand the senator is due to meet with the minister where he will be able to raise uh, the matters uh, directly. In line with my commitment yesterday, I have also written to Senator Pocock to provide some additional information uh, regarding the uh, government's priorities on housing and homelessness, and I now table my response to him. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I also have two matters to follow up from question time uh, this week. On the 1st of August, I undertook during question time to come back and provide further detail to Senator Rustin in relation to questions uh, asked uh, to the Minister for Health. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be able to provide the further detail to the Senate now. Labor is committed to supporting patients to navigate the health system, including through nurse telehealth initiatives, particularly those patients with rare genetic and complex conditions. We recognise the role of telehealth nurses in assisting patients who are facing enormous life challenges in navigating the web of complex health services. That is why the uh, Albanese government committed to providing $2.47 million to address this through uh, the next budget. The government remains committed to implementing the election commitment to fund a program of supports for patients with rare and complex diseases to better navigate the health system. And Minister Butler has directed the Department of Health to identify the best way to deliver these services, working directly with the range of organisations supporting people with rare genetic and complex conditions. Um, I have one other matter which I, yesterday I undertook during question time to come back and provide further detail to Senator Lambie in relation to questions the senator asked to the Assistant Treasurer um, and the Minister for Financial Services. I'm pleased uh, to provide the further detail to Senator Lambie and the Chamber now. The government is currently in the process of considering and consulting on draft regulations related to superannuation annual member members meeting notices. Uh, superannuation funds are required to provide certain information in AMM notices to members to support them in effectively engaging with trustees during the meeting. The question and answer process during the meeting remains the primary mechanism for members to obtain information from their fund that is directly relevant to their interests. The government's aim is to pro promote a high level of meaningful transparency for superannuation members by streamlining disclosure requirements for superannuations annual members meeting notices. Regulations issued by the previous government did not align with the national accounting standards and led to double counting and other misleading information. Under the draft regulations, funds will still be required to provide written notice to members which detail fund performance, their outcomes for the period, the total payments they make 
to industrial bodies, employer or employees, marketing and advocacy. There is no proposed change to the disclosure remuneration details. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Bragg. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by uh, Ministers Gallagher and um, Watt. No, sorry, not Watt. Um, Farrell. Now, very important that I remember people's names. Um, so what we've heard today in question time is a good opportunity to reflect upon the economic management of the nation, uh, the statements that were made in the last parliament about uh, expenditure and where we go from here. Now, uh, there were questions about certain components of the government's commitments uh, to spend taxpayers' funds. And of course, in the last parliament, uh, people who have a short or even a medium term memory would recall that it was the then opposition that was wanting JobKeeper to be paid to uh, foreign nationals, uh, foreign students, foreign corporations, uh, and of course had a range of other expenditure proposals around uh, paying Australians to go and get vaccinations, even though we were in fact the most vaccinated nation on earth, pretty much. Uh, so um, I understand that people like to make these statements when they're in opposition. I try and restrain myself while I'm here. But certainly it is a matter of public record that uh, the Labor Party wanted to spend too much money. Uh, and, and look, there will be analysis done over this period of time. And we have gone through a historically high period of public expenditure. And as someone who values uh, intergenerational equity, um, I would say that we spent perhaps more money than we should have. But it was a very significant crisis. It was a very significant economic shock. Uh, and the idea that uh, the talking points you hear from the government that there's a X number of liberal debt or whatever else they say uh, ignores the fact that everyone, every reasonable person expected that the government of the day would have put its hand in its pocket to protect and preserve the economy uh, in large part as we knew it as we tried to address the significant health and economic shock. So yes, there was money spent. Uh, there may have been some wasteful spending on the margins, uh, but certainly the now government, I think, is in a very weak position to lecture the Liberal Party and the National Party, which is now the opposition, on expenditure, given its attempted expenditure of uh, funds to foreign students, foreign corporations, <laughs> and the like uh, in the last parliament. And of course, uh, I think we will long remember the, uh, the idea that we should, of course, pay Australians, the most vaccinated people on earth, effectively, to go and get a, a shot. Now, uh, that's on the expenditure side. And what we need to do in this parliament and future parliaments is to improve the budget position. Um, I don't think it's a fair approach for future generations that we are going to uh, have a, a significant level of debt that will make it harder for us to prepare for future shocks. Now, one of the issues we have in this place, I think, is that uh, we have too few uh, young people in the parliament. And I think if we had some more younger people in the parliament, I'm not casting aspersions here or saying anyone should try and solve this problem today, I think we would take a longer view on the build-up of debt that has occurred uh, over the past decade, because um, at 30 per cent, 35 per cent of uh, GDP, debt to, to, to GDP, it, it is a historically high position for the country. And we do need to find a way to get that down, uh, because if we do go above 50 per cent, uh, uh, it would be very difficult for us to do the same, deploy the same economic measures that were deployed in the last parliament. And I say, um, that many of those measures were deployed with bipartisan support. So uh, it is a challenge for us to try and look at the intergenerational reports findings, uh, that we have a significant issue with the tax base, uh, a pretty adverse dependency ratio. Uh, and so we do want to try and improve that over the long term. 
Now, uh, the other thing that was uh, said today that I think was, was important uh, was uh, in relation to the, uh, to the, the, well, I mean, the tax side of the budget. Um, we also want to, over the medium term, have a good look at how we can uh, improve the sustainability of the tax base. Uh, we, of course, are too reliant upon uh, direct taxation. Uh, we should, over the long run, look at how we can have a more sustainable approach and a more competitive approach to taxation. Senator Green. And thanks for the opportunity to contribute um, to talk about the answers given um, by Senator Gallagher and um, Farrell, although we asked Senator Farrell that question. But um, I, I'm a big fan of tourism, so glad to be able to have that opportunity. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Um, and I'll remind the senator um, uh, it would be good to have more young people in parliament. And I congratulate Senator Payman on her election at 27 years old. She's going to make a fantastic senator, hopefully, for many years to come. Um, the uh, answers given by um, Minister Gallagher uh, around um, uh, our cost of living uh, uh, issues um, are important, and, and we know that people in this country are hurting. And we know that this is a difficult economic time, and it is a difficult um, uh, economic set of books that we inherited from the previous government. But it gave uh, Minister Gallagher another opportunity to update the Senate on the uh, economic situation that we are facing. And it is very important that Australians understand, and I believe that they do understand. And I believe that's why uh, the members opposite are, are sitting on those benches now, because we did inherit a trillion dollars of Liberal debt, a trillion dollars of debt. And we are committed to fiscal responsibility, unlike those opposite. Now they'll tell you that that debt was incurred at a time where they couldn't possibly have not spent that money. But we know that they doubled the debt before COVID-19. They had doubled the debt before the COVID-19 crisis. We've inherited high inflation and rising interest rates and historically low wages because those opposite were not invested in lifting real wages, not interested in making sure that the minimum wage would rise. Uh, and that's why we've got a situation now where we've got high inflation and low wages. They, they're the highest, they were the highest spending and highest borrowing government in Australia. And this is the really important point that Senator, Senator Gallagher made today. And those opposite would do well to listen, maybe before their next tactics meeting, because it's how they spent their money that Australians really noticed. They spent that money in rorts, in colour-coded spreadsheets, and buying off the National Party. And that's and, and they did that in a systematic way to make sure that all they cared about was themselves and not delivering for all Australians. But that's not what the Albanese Labor government will be doing. We've already started the really hard work of dealing with the cost of living crisis. The Albanese Labor government secured an increase to the minimum wage, finally. Finally, for minimum wage workers, we've increased the minimum wage by putting forward a, a genuine and sympathetic proposal to the Fair Work Commission. It was our first step in getting the, our plan to get real work wages work, um, moving. On top of that, we've got a plan to reduce vital, the cost of vital medicines and make them cheaper, cutting the maximum co-payment under the PBS by 29%. We're also making it easier to get access to bulk build health care with the establishment of 50 urgent care clinics. And of course, uh, as we know, we are improving access and affordability of early childhood education. And we know this will be instrumental for our economy. It's, re it's always an, of interest to me, the response uh, from those opposite in regards to Labor's childcare policy and investing in childcare and making childcare cheaper. Because I'm no this is not a view possibly shared by everyone on the other side. But on this side, we know that investing in childcare is an, is an economic policy. It's an economic policy because it saves families money and it gets people back to work. More affordable childcare means more opportunities for families to increase their weekly pay. And as Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said, this is a plan for reform that will deliver economic potential. It just makes sense. 
Australians can also be assured that we are addressing the skills crisis, and Senator Farrell addressed this crisis, the skills crisis we have in our tourism industry right now, something that the former government refused to acknowledge or address in their time. The very first piece of legislation we introduced was to create Jobs and Skills Australia so that we can get on with the work of getting Australians into work. And Jobs and Skills Australia will be pivotal for the economy and our economic recovery um, as we recover from 10 years of neglect, from mistakes and from mess, from trillion dollars of debt, from rorts and waste that the previous government left behind for every Australian. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. And uh, it's interesting. I'll just take off there from Senator Green's comments about the skills crisis. The former coalition government spent $100 million on subsidising uh, TAFE apprenticeships by 50 per cent. That was a fantastic scheme, uh, and it just goes to show that this is the party of the battlers. Now, don't don't kid yourself. This is the party that wants to throw money, throw money at the big end of town. Make no mistake about that. If you want, you know. And what's interesting, what's interesting about question time is, whenever questions were put to the Senator Gallagher, she had absolutely no answers for the way forward. Absolutely no answers for the way forward. And I tell you what, you won't say anything from Senator Wong either. I well remember when she turned up to RAT, um, when she, she was talking about trying to have a crack at the Leppington Triangle and claim that you know we'd paid $30 million for a $3 million block of land. And Senator Stirl couldn't understand why I was being so quiet. And of course, I just sat back there and let Senator Wong show how little she understood about finance, because had she known, had she actually understood accounting standards and valuation standards and prior case law, she would have known that you pay the best use. Okay, AASB 13, paragraphs 29 and 30, uh, and if uh, Senator Wong or anyone else on that side of the chamber would like a lesson in finance, I'm, I'm more than happy to help. And, uh, and I, will, I won't just sit here and bag you out. I'll actually give you some free solutions. First of all, you've got to identify the problem. And of course, the problem was none other than Paul J Keating, who basically, under the Hawke government, uh, basically ripped the guts out of the manufacturing sector in Victoria with the Button Plan, uh, commoditised uh, up higher education with the Dawkins Plan, where suddenly education was just treated like a, another commodity. Anyone who wants a degree can get a degree, and of course that gutted the TAFE sector. So we've thrown all this money into the university sector at the expense of the TAFE sector. Now let me get this very straight, and I want this on record. This country was built by the battlers. It wasn't built by the blowhards. And you've got to put your primary industries in front of your secondary industries in front of your tertiary industries. And we've got to get people back in those workshops, back in the manufacturing sector, uh, back on the farms and value adding our primary production. That's where we've got to go back to. And the way to do that is to cut taxes. And, and that is something that the uh, coalition government has a proud record on. I tell you, and, and also not shut the economy down. And you know, they, they like to bag us out, the former coalition government, for the so-called money that we spent. Well, let, let me assure you that before the COVID crisis had broken out, we had balanced the budget. In 2018-19, the budget was balanced for the first time in a number of decades, since actually the prior uh, coalition government. But what happened was what we had were the state premiers okay, just wrecking the economy. Now, you know, I disagreed with the, Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister on this, but he tried to set up a national cabinet in the best interests of the country. And, the country was sabotaged by Labor premiers who continually locked down, who continually ran a free fear program, who continually wanted to throw more money, even when we pulled JobSeeker. Labor, the Labor opposition at the time, the now Labor government, wanted to keep spending money, wanted to keep spending money, keep it going. And this is the sad thing, and they're still going to pursue spending more money. They're going to drop $20 billion on building transmission lines for all these unreliables that aren't going to go you know, 24 hours a day when the sun, you know, they're not going to work when the sun isn't shining or anything like that. If you want to get this country back on track, we need to invest in baseload energy. And that's why I'm so pleased that the opposition leader, uh, uh, the member for Dixon, um, has now looked at, uh, you know, has now said the coalition will also look into nuclear as well. And that's a fantastic idea. We can have uh, coal as well as nuclear as well as gas, because with cheap, reliable um, energy, that is how we will power this country. 
But going forward, I'm still yet to hear anything about uh, what the RBA does as well. And this was another big stuff up uh, by the former Prime Minister Paul Keating when he actually gave RBA the independence. Anyone that has followed monetary policy as closely as I have for the last 30 years would know that the, all the RBA governors basically graduated from university and started work at the RBA. They are hoodwinked by RBA groupthink. They are more focused on inflation, and it is the tail that wags the dog. Because let me tell you this, when you, if you got washed up on a desert island, would you either A, go to the bank, or B, look to control the means of production? And I'll tell you what you'd look to do, you'd look to control the means of production. You wouldn't go, oh, well, we can't build any infrastructure because we might have too much inflation. No, 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 no. What we would do is we would go out, we would develop, and we would actually start building which is what we need to do. What, you should be listening to this, Senator Wong. I'm happy to you know, walk you through it because I know, you know it's a bit of baby steps with you at the moment. Um, but I'm more than happy we have to build. You guys have got to build if you want to get this economy back on track. Well, would you like me to get him to withdraw? Uh, uh, Senator Gregory. Thank you. Um, I also uh, rise to uh, respond to the answers from Senators Gallagher and Farrell. Um, I find it interesting the constant referral to the fact that the questions aren't being answered, when just a brief um, cursory glance at the transcript shows quite clearly that there are plenty of answers coming, just maybe not sufficient listening occurring to understand those answers and then perhaps ask some further questions that may have a bit more um, relevance than what we have maybe seen today. Now, I will say that Labor has a comprehensive fiscal plan. The Albanese Labor government has come forward with a comprehensive plan in a time of extreme uncertainty. We come in on the back of nine long years of rorts and wrecking, and our plan will start to give the country hope and start to turn that around into a productive economy and into further and better opportunities for the people of Australia. We have been clear with our approach to the October budget. We have been clear about the work that is going to be undertaken to review the waste and the warts that have been occurring over the last nine years and that are evident in the March budget. And we will trawl through that to find those warts, to find that waste and to get rid of them. And we will deliver on savings and we will invest then in the productive side of the economy. We will actually look to build things for the future, to build a pathway for the future, in our manufacturing, in other industries that we know are critical to the future of Australia. Rather than what we have seen from the current opposition when they were in government, where they borrowed more, they oversaw a significant decline in productivity, they spent more, they taxed more. And we've seen this over the last almost decade. But our plan to invest in the productive side of the economy will show that hope and will show that future pathway, we will address the skills and training shortages. And that is going to start right now. Those conversations are on foot right now. And the Jobs and Skills Summit in September, 1st and 2nd of September, will see that conversation, that open, transparent and clear conversation, consulting with the critical people for whom this impacts and for whom will take it forward. That includes the community, that includes business, that includes the unions, that includes the skills and training providers, the people who will make a difference as we build a productive future for Australia. We have procurement and co-investment strategies that will help business invest in those industries of the future that will build a better future for everyone in Australia. And we have a clear plan for cheaper, better energy. Yes, we will indeed look at the transmission lines. And no, it is not a waste. These are the things that are going to ensure that we have an efficient and effective energy system into the future. We will look at developing further renewable energy, 
because that is the way of the future and it is cheaper. We just need to stop having these attacks on areas where we know that renewables are cheaper. We know that for a fact and we know that there is a pathway to get them fully implemented into the system. And if you were to go down the path of nuclear energy, what are you going to do for the next umpteen years while you try to develop that system? We don't need those things. We need to look at what we have on hand right now. And that is renewable energy as the cheapest, best way forward for the country. And we have a plan to pursue that. In addition, we care deeply about the people of this country. We care deeply about the economic future of this country and the budget that will be delivered in October will chart that pathway. We are in a really, really difficult situation created by the opposition, the previous government, over nine long, wasteful, rotting years. Thank you. Senator MacDonald. Thank you very much. And look, it is fascinating to understand uh, in greater detail each day the difference between those on the other side and those on this side and their understanding of what makes an economy work, what makes cost of living pressures work, what makes uh, cost of electricity work, uh, what are the levers of government that you can pull that make an economy successful. And it doesn't matter how many times are those opposites say say words, it doesn't make them true. It just makes them tediously repetitive. What I want to talk to you about is what it's really like to run a business and run a nation, and how proud I am of the legacy that we have left of the last nine years, one of only nine nations in the world to maintain a AAA credit rating following COVID, the greatest economic impact a financial shock on, in the globe since the 1920s. How proud I am of the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. That means that people are at work in purposeful, meaningful work. Uh, that is incredibly important. Uh, we have left an economy that is ready to take, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the resources boom, the demand for Australia's uh, agricultural industry. Uh, we are poised to take advantage of all of that and we'll just have to see uh, what Labor is going to do with the good fortune that they have been left with. Because the Treasurer has said that the point of his statement was to paint a picture of the economy. That is a gorgeous kind of description, but the economy is not an abstract painting. It requires a plan. It requires tough decisions. Uh, in tough circumstances. And so what we are facing now, the tough circumstances of today are higher costs of living that are facing Australians. Uh, and so we know what that looks like. It looks like the pain for small businesses who are working 18 hours a day, who are struggling with not being able to find workers to help them to do the jobs. And in regional Australia, that means deliver the services that make everybody else's lives possible. Families counting cents as they fill up the car, whether or not they will be able to have the children still enrolled in sport, uh, if they're going to have to drive some distance to take them to training. Young Australians trying to build their first homes and students trying to create a better life for themselves. So the economy is not a mystery. The economy is made up of some very practical pieces. And I can tell you that the cost of power prices, the cost of power prices is one of the things that is crippling small business today, uh, right across the country. Uh, and I know that from the days of running my business, uh, there was just not enough margin left in it in order to be able to continue running the business uh, with the prices that we have today. Uh, that is terrifying because my business was providing food to families. Uh, these costs of power prices is something that we have to understand that the conversion to renewable energy takes time. It took 100 years for oil to come in and take over from the horse, horsepower, and yet we want to change our economy within 15 years. Uh, laugh if you will, but it's not a laughing matter for those people who are going to pay 
the cost of transmission lines, because renewable energy projects that are being built in my part of the world are not hooked up. They're not being hooked up to the power lines because they cannot take the intermittent power voltage that is the result of renewables. And so we don't even have reliable power now in Queensland and renewable places, and yet we're hooking up uh, solar farms and wind farms that are just rusting away because nobody bothered to figure out whether or not the Queensland government would ever plug them in. So that is why it is so important that we bring more gas supply to the market. We keep the electricity um, uh, reliable and dispatchable and affirmed energy system because it is not a laugh laughing matter, it is not a fantasy. Uh, we cannot change our energy supply as fast as those opposite would like to. I, I have no criticism of their aspirations, but we live in the world of the reality of where the absence uh, of reliable transmission lines, the absence of uh, firmed power, means that we will end up with no power at all. Uh, we won't end up with power to take ore out of the ground for the minerals that will reduce emissions. Thank you. Senator Hent, oh, sorry, I have to put the question first. I put the question to the, uh, to the motion moved by Senator Bragg. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by uh, Senator Wong uh, to my questions in relation to the Murray Darling Basin plan and the 450 gigalitres that was uh, promised to South Australia is legally required under law to be delivered, and that to date only two gigalitres. Uh, has been uh, returned uh, because, as we know, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr. Deputy President, that uh, under the last government, the Liberal National Go Government, there was a uh, desire to slow down, to sabotage, to stop that 450 gigalitres being delivered. There was never uh, a genuine commitment from the uh, Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison. Uh, government in relation uh, to uh, making sure South Australia uh, got that water or that the water was uh, made available uh, to save the river and to look after the environment. And I must say, Mr Deputy President, as a South Australian, uh, it is just absolutely galling to find out again uh, that it has been mismanaged so appallingly that money has been wasted, billions of dollars spent on bogus infrastructure projects. So the money has been poured down the drain, the water hasn't been uh, secured, and we are edging towards the deadline by which this plan is meant to be fulfilled. Uh, and we are now staring down the barrel of uh, this uh, plan being in breach of the law and South Australia and the lower reaches of the Murray uh, suffering as a result. And of course, um, this was failure by design, Mr Deputy President, failure by design uh, from those opposite uh, who were never, uh, never intended uh, to make sure that that water for the environment was secured. Uh, they're too interested in looking after the interests of their big corporate irrigator mates uh, than doing what is right uh, by everybody else, upstream, downstream, the small farmers and, of course, the environment and those of us who live at the end of the river system who desperately need uh, a living river, a healthy river, uh, for um, our own water supply. Now, it is now a challenge for the current government, the Labor government, who promised also to make sure uh, this water would be delivered in time and, I might add, Mr Deputy President, uh, in time and in full. Well, it is now a challenge to uh, the Labor government to get out there and start buying the water because it is the only way uh, it is going to be secured. And I'm not a huge fan of the Productivity Commission, Mr Deputy President. I think from time to time they come up with some good ideas, uh, but their analysis on this, Mr Deputy President, is crystal clear. The Productivity Commission themselves have said over and over again that the most economically efficient, 
environmentally effective way to ensure this water is secured for South Australia and the survival of the river is to buy it. Is to buy it. But despite that advice, we still have, uh, after a decade, of minister after minister sitting on their hands and refusing to go into the market to buy off willing sellers and to return that water to the river. Well, the challenge is now on. After a decade of mismanagement and failure by design, water thieving, scratching the backs of their big corporate mates from the Liberal National Party, and let's not forget when Mr Barnaby Joyce was Water Minister, it was his great big idea to make sure that this plan would fail. We now have a challenge to the current government that they have a responsibility to fix it, and the, time, and the clock is ticking. So I've heard the response from the minister today, and I welcome it, that voluntary buybacks uh, are, are on the table. Uh, well, don't wait any longer. Get out there now and start buying the water, because we are running out of time. We need the water bought, secured, and delivered because our River Murray is the lifeblood of our nation's food bowl. It is the lifeblood, uh, particularly in South Australia. And if uh, the Labor Party uh, wish to continue uh, to hold that new seat that they have in South Australia, the seat of Boothby, then bet your bottom dollar they're going to have to make sure they secure that water for South Australia and they secure it now. I'm going to put the motion as moved by Senator Hanson-Young. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it.